Thank you so much for listening to Breadwinning Mums. We really appreciate your continued support over the last year, and we're happy to announce that we have published the Breadwinning Mums book. Yay! This book is based on the conversations from the Breadwinning Mums season one episodes. It highlights the candid journeys of each mums, as well as a golden nugget of wisdom from their life's lessons. Now is the perfect time to give the gift of the Breadwinning Mums book to the special mums in your life or to yourself. No matter where you are in life, I'm sure the practical tips within the Breadwinning Mums book will help you take your lives just a little bit further. Limited copies available, so order yours now at breadwinningmums.com. That's breadwinningmums.com. Coming up next on The Breadwinning Mums. Parents are judged by their children. A well-behaved child speaks to the success of you as a parent. I don't agree with that. I think, you know, that sets us up to feel really isolated from the community of parents that all have a shared experience. Parenting is full of joys and and lots of stuff that's beautiful but it's also really hard work and some days the top of the mountain you need to climb on any given day can Mm. seem unattainable yeah you just need to i think we all need to kind of be a bit honest about it's hard and i think we we don't give ourselves enough permission to not manage Hello everyone and welcome to the Breadwinning Mums podcast. This is a place where we debunk the myths of working mums, cheer each other on and show the world that you can be a mum and still pursue excellence in your chosen area of expertise. Today we're chatting with Janice Mitchell, the CEO of Australian Childhood Foundation, Director of Centre for Excellence in Therapeutic Care and an adjunct associate professor at Southern Cross University. Janice shared her life story about growing up as a headstrong and self-assured girl, accompanying her mum giving relief care towards a state, a work that would later shape her career and purpose in life. I hope you'll enjoy this episode with Janice Mitchell. Hello, Janice. Hi, Jane. So happy to have you here. How are you? I'm really well. I'm really well. The sun's shining for a change, so that's good. I'm (laughs) looking out on gum trees and a river, so I really can't complain. That's good. Wonderful day in Melbourne. It is a wonderful day in Melbourne. (laughs) So, Janice, we've met just once before, and uh, we had the pleasure of meeting because your office, your Sydney office, is conveniently located across the hallway from mine. So, very happy accident there. But before we go into the details that you do um, with your work, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah. Um, So, I'm the CEO of the Australian Childhood Foundation. Um, I've worked for the foundation for 28 years, Mm. aim CEO um, earlier this year with the the sudden passing of our CEO, but had been his deputy for the 28 years before that. So it was kind of something that we'd pioneered a bit together. Um, I'm a social worker by training, so I've kind of spent most of my 30 plus, 35 plus years in the field working in the child and family welfare area. Um, But more importantly, I'm a mum, 
got two kids. They're in their 20s. I don't know that you ever stop being a mum and dealing with the trials and tribulations of <laughs> what your kids throw up to you. But yeah. um, And a mum to two dogs as well, so they keep me busy. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what do you have, boy, girl? I have oh. my daughter is 28 and my son's 26. Ah, nice. How was the early years? They were fun. You know, I think I never really understood um, how different two kids could be from the same yeah. kids until I had yeah. my own. You know, you yeah. kind of do that nature nurture. You know, yeah. you hear all about that and then you kind of yeah. have kids of your own. You go, oh, my God, did someone give me the wrong <laughs> child at the hospital? This child is so different. Yeah. Which one was the easy baby, the first one or the second one? Well, you know, I think the universe gave me an – Kate was easier. So the, Kate, my daughter, was easier yeah. overall. Yeah. Um. Apart from her kind of first three months where she was one of those stereotypically colicky kind of, you know, oh, yeah. arsenic hour, you know, kids yeah. that yeah. would cry um, yeah. for hours and hours. Once we got through that bit, she kind of slipped into, I don't know whether she'd read the books, but she did that four hours <laughs> sleeping, you know, by four months she was sleeping through the night. You know, Oh, was, what? I know. Okay. Yeah. I think that lulled me into a false sense of security that I could go back yeah. and have another one. Yeah, yeah. He it's the two-year scout. <laughs> there was two weeks minus just, yeah, so just under two years. Kate, as soon as Matthew was born, she yeah. was just turning two and she yeah. turned into this completely different child. She stopped sleeping through the night. She... Oh. Um, I had to take my mum with me to yeah. go shopping because she yeah. was just so we, I needed to have one on one with yeah. her out in yeah. public because she just reacted really badly to Matthew's arrival. Yeah. It was kind of full on for a little while and Matthew never slept. Oh no. <laughs> so I can I think I can count on one hand in that first 12 months. Yeah. The number of times they were both asleep during the day at the same time. <laughs> okay. So, and how long did it go for? A year. Oh, wow. That first year of Matthew's life with the two of them yeah. was really hard. And I think, yeah. I think you think because, you know, you're a professional in the area and you've developed parenting programs and all the rest of it, you put so much expectation additional expectation on yourself you should be able to you can see what's yeah. going on but then the yeah. reality of I'm still yeah. me and I'm exhausted yeah. and I'm yeah. everything else that's going on in my day yeah I can't be the best version of myself all the time yeah yeah no the irony's not lost on me the deputy CEO of the Australian Childhood Foundation still finds it hard to bring her own children it's uh but it's it's a comforting thing to know that it happens to the best of us right and we just well I think it's 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 a journey yeah it's there's no science to it yeah. it's every yeah. child is unique every parent's yeah. unique that yeah. every relationship between the two is unique yeah. What will work yesterday won't work tomorrow. What worked for one yeah. child won't work for another child. So it yeah. really is um, a learning as you go and being patient and kind with yourself and with yeah. your children, you know, yeah. and and not, not expecting more than is possible to give on any given day. And yep. on days when you're running low on what you can give, making sure you've got people around you to give you the support that you need. You know, I think yep. that the strength for all of us as parents is feeling mm -hmm. confident and um, brave enough sometimes to put your hand up and say, hey, I just need a bit of support right now. I think yep. so much of parenting now, you know, parents are judged by their children success yep. or you know yep. a well-behaved child speaks to the success of you as a parent I don't agree with that I think you know 
that sets us up to feel really isolated from the community of parents that all have a shared experience. Parenting is full of joys and and lots of stuff that's beautiful, but it's also really hard work. And some days the top of the mountain you need to climb on any given day can Mm. seem unattainable. Yeah, You just need to, I think we all need to kind of be a bit honest about it's hard and Mm. we, you know, the it takes a village thing is true. Yeah. And I think we we don't give ourselves enough permission to not manage or yeah. to say, I need some support. And I think we're all so much more isolated from our support systems these days that, mm. you know, in my experience and the experience through work, because what I did was, which was kind of funny was when my kids were little at work we were starting this parenting initiative called every child is important and Mm. I had to start writing um, these booklets and brochures and different things around parenting and and it's okay to ask for support and you know communication and the foundations of good relationships with your kids are the basis on which you can deal with most challenges Mm. Um, so it was kind of my lived experience at the time with my own kids that really shaped what I wrote Mm. what I heard was coming back um, once the the things that I'd written were out kind of in the the broader parenting community was that that was everyone's shared experience but there was no what no space to kind of say yeah that's me too yeah, because everyone you know had to be seen to be just doing well and managing, and yeah, it's not the yeah, case. yeah, spot on. And I think taking ourselves, the parent, from the parental role from that pedestal, also gives our children the ability to just be, to yeah. just be kids. It's okay to throw tantrums when you're hungry because that's just a human condition but how we deal with that afterwards is the learning that we all need to to go through right yeah yeah I'm glad that you that you um that you mentioned that um okay can you take us back to the very young Janice did you know that you were going to be a mom what was she like headstrong my mum would say I was very I remember my mum telling this story and it's always stuck with me. You know the first day of school Mm. when your your parent takes you to the gate the first day. My mum would tell the story often about she took me to the gate and I quite confidently turned around and said, see your mum, waved and walked off. (laughs) And my mum was so distraught by that because everyone yeah. else's kids were clinging to their legs and, yeah. <laughs> you know, didn't yeah. want to go through the gate and I happily kind of walked off. So um, <laughs> my mum would talk about that I was always quite self-assured and confident, yeah, which was kind of right, but yeah. at the same time I was the kid that, would go bright red if I had to read out loud in class. You know when you had to do those, you know, read the next paragraph yeah. in the yeah. classroom? I was the yeah. kid that didn't feel confident enough to do that. So huh. I had a confidence about the world that my parents gave me that made me feel like I could manage, hmm. but there were some things around public. Like if I kind of think now, you know, around where I've come, it's it, I stand up in front of 3,000 people now and so yeah. if I kind of yeah. go back to, wow, that kid that couldn't read out loud in class, yeah. where I am now, it's hilarious, I think. I, <laughs> oh, my God, that kid would never have believed it. Yeah. I think the other thing is that I, um, I, I, I think when I did... What I learned from my parents is, and I I really took this into my own parenting, is trust your kids to know Mm. stuff and let them make their own mistakes Um, and be there to pick up the pieces. You know, you can't control everything. You can't 
tell kids. You can't tell kids. Kids learn by doing a lot of the time. And so telling them cognitively, they're not taking that in. They've got to learn through experience. So I think my parents did that really well. And I, I just remember being given lots of opportunities to succeed and lots of opportunities to fail and feel what that failure felt like. Yeah. I think now we get really protective. We don't we want to protect kids from everything, including yeah. failure. And yeah. I see, you know, when my kids were little and at school, I saw so many parents complaining that, you know, my child hasn't had a student of the week award for whatever, whatever, and everyone needs to get a ribbon, doesn't matter whether they came first or last, you know, all of this stuff, which I think is important in building kids' self-esteem, but it's got to be balanced with giving them opportunities to fail as well. Yeah, it teaches them how to be more resilient in life, which is life's going to throw a lot of learning milestones. A lot of purples, and you can't... um, as they grow, you can't assure their success in everything. They've got to yep. feel the pain of what it might feel like to come second, third, fourth or last in something or to fail a test or, you know, I, I just mm. those kind of experiences I think are really important. I think yep. the other thing that the little Janice has taken into life is my mum was a... Um, So I was a child of the 60s. My mum was a relief cottage parent for children who were in the child protection system and weren't able to live at home and they Mm. used to call them cottages. And so my mum was a relief cottage parent and it was you can't do it by any stretch now, but you used to be able to take your own children with you when when she did these shifts. So she would do these shifts that um, allowed the the full-time carers to have an evening off Mm. or a weekend off. And so when it was an evening off, I often would go with her. And these were the houses where there might have been six or eight what was called wards of the state, so kids who'd Mm. been removed from their parents' care because they weren't safe, they'd been abused and and life hadn't treated Mm. them well. And these Mm. kids came with so many needs and so many different kind of behaviours that I witnessed as a little kid. Mm. Um, And I think that, and it wasn't until I was in my probably 40s that I connected the dot around my careers taking me down this path to those early days with my mum being with the kids that I've spent my life's work, Mm. you know, working with and for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's interesting the experiences we give our kids, even inadvertently, Mm. just because we're that's just what we're doing, can kind of come to roost down the track and really shape and influence the things that they hold as important and the directions Mm. they take in life. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. What was the experience like for you then growing up? Sometimes, you know, spending the odd weekend with um, children who were wards of the state. Um, I remember it as being really fun. They were really fun kids. Mm. But I also remember um, times when there'd be one of the kids would be on the roof and the police would need to be called because they Mm. were just whatever or one of the kids Mm. hadn't come home. So I remember those sorts of things. You know, at the time I was probably eight or nine. Mm. So I remember there being times when police had to be involved or there was lots of concern about the behaviour of some of the kids being a bit risky. Um, So I do remember that side of it. But I also yeah. remember them just being kids and having fun with them. I remember we got to go to the Royal Melbourne Show. You know, mm. we all piled into a mini bus and and kind of did that. And I think, I think that has helped me be really Humanized. clear about these kids are more than the sum of what they do. Yeah, they are first and foremost kids. You know, and when you see all the debates in the media at the moment around kids in youth justice and, you know, kids getting up to mischief, most of these kids 
have had these sorts of experiences in their past. They're not doing it because they're bad kids. They're doing it because they've been dealt a bad hand in life and yeah. needing to see the whole child, the whole person, not just what they're doing and understanding yeah. how they got to this place and why they're doing it and what's the need that this behaviour mm. is fulfilling or communicating about um an unmet need that they've got. I think that yeah. that's really helped me. Even, you know, those kids way back when I was eight and nine were first and foremost kids. They liked to laugh. They liked to have fun. They were, you know, gregarious and and got up to mischief like kids did. And then there was this other part of them at times that was really at times a bit scary, at times mm. challenging for all the adults to the point where police had to get involved. So I think that mm really shaped me now having an, yep. an in-depth understanding of these kids are more than the sum of the, the annoying, challenging things that they do. Yeah, and it, it's a very interesting um, finding as well, it's particularly the work that you did with your uh, late business partner, Dr. Uh, Dr. Joe Tucci. I think um, he mentioned um, trauma transformative practice. Mm. And, you know, it's just one of those things, like how long is a piece of string? Is it just back to the kids, that particular child's uh, childhood? Or is it even further back to their children, uh, their parents' childhood? Or even, you know, a couple of generations back. And so would, are you able to tell us a little bit more about that work that you did with Dr. Twitchy and um, the type of recommendations that you have offered to either just the general public and or the, yeah. um, the powers that be? That's a big question, Jane. I think, yeah. you know, um, you're right in pointing to the fact that trauma as a result of violence that's been caused by another person, so interpersonal violence, not a car accident or a natural disaster, but things that are violence or trauma that's caused by another person to a person, if we talk about that as, as the trauma we're talking about, then what we know is what the neurobiology of development tells us is that the impacts of trauma can be passed on genetically across yeah. generations so mm -hmm. that the trauma if it's sustained enough and chronic enough can actually change um the the kind of genetic makeup across generations mm. so that's one thing we know and and certainly that's the case for um Many people in First Nations contexts, colonised cultures, not just mm. First Nations, there's lots of colonised cultures around the world um, where the it's kind of the reverberating impacts across the generation. So it's not yeah. just, you know, a traumatised parent who's carrying their own trauma is going to find it difficult to parent if they don't have insight into the impact of their own trauma into their yeah. parenting because parenting is a really hard job full stop. Yeah. If you've got a range of your own vulnerabilities because of trauma that you've lived and haven't had the opportunity to work through, then mm. it's really hard not for that not to interfere in your parenting relationship. It's very mm. hard for you to be regulated and stay calm mm. in the face of your child's behaviour if you yeah. find it difficult to be regulated and calm, full stop. And mm. trauma does that. Trauma makes it really hard for people to find a state of calm and mm. to regulate really strong feelings and be able to take a breath and a step back and go, hang on, what's mm. going on? And that kind of stopping and pausing and reflecting before we act is a lot about what we need to do as parents. So yep. parents with trauma find that really hard because they didn't have their needs met around yeah. the co-regulation of emotions when they were infants. Yeah. Very hard then for them to be able to offer that opportunity to their own children. And then if we don't get in early and kind of deal with the impacts of what that means mm -hmm. for children, 
then, you know, it's possible that that cycle will repeat. What we know is, and so that's the kind of the intergenerational aspect of it, which is which is why it's really important not to blame parents. You know, we've mm. got to move away from blaming parents who've experienced trauma for mm. not being able to always meet their child's needs in the best possible way. Yeah. Because they have to have their needs understood. It doesn't excuse dangerous or risky behaviour, but it's got to be the frame that we come with in understanding what might be going on for the parents and think about what does that mean for how we're going to support them. Mm. Um, And we see it as well now. There's a lot of um, rightful reliance on kinship placement, so extended family. If mum and or dad can't look after their child, then can a grandparent, rather than going to foster care, is there an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent? Now, if there's lots of trauma sitting in that family, we need to understand that for the whole family group and support that family group around that as well as help them support the child in relation to the trauma they've experienced so that the relationship will work. Because what we know is if Harm happens in the context of a relationship. If if children are abused and hurt, adults as children who have grown into adults, if their trauma happened in the context of a relationship when they were a child and that's not been addressed, then it's very hard for them to be in a relationship in the way their their child will need without some support. Not Mm -hmm. always professional support if they're well-resourced with people around them you know, to, mm. to buffer and support them, that will work. Um, but kids need relationships. We we all do. We all grow in the context of a network of relationships. And so we need to kind of understand that, not blame parents that are struggling. We need to kind of take the time to understand what that struggle's about and where it came from so that we can give the sort of support that's needed um, mm. that's going to be helpful for them and for their ability to be the parent they need to be for their child. Kids, and then there's the, the next bit around trauma is that so many people think that, um, and this is really the case for many in the context of family violence, people mm. for such a long time have thought and still do that if children don't see violence, they're not affected by it. Mm. Um, and what we know is that that's not true because violence mm. robs the relationship of the qualities relationships need to offer children. So if I'm a mum and I'm in a violent relationship with my partner and I've got my baby is in another mm. room asleep, yep. They're not seeing it. Mm. They may be hearing it, mm. but as a woman and as a mother, the impact of the violence on me is going to affect the what yes. I've got then to be able to give to my child. And so yeah. what we know is and what we've found when we've looked back at the thousands of children we've supported over the years What's really common in more than 80% of the kids that we end up providing counselling to is that the first experience of violence happened before the age of one. Wow. Now, at that age, kids aren't verbal. Mm. And from a developmental point of view, if you don't have language At the time that the abuse happened, Mm -hmm. it's very difficult for you down the track to be able to talk about what happened because you didn't, at the time that it happened, you didn't have words. Mm. If it happens to you once your language is developed, you can describe and talk Mm -hmm. about what happened. But if you're pre-verbal, if you don't have language, then it's very difficult for you to be able to talk about those very early experiences. And for Mm. a long time, that's why people thought that babies weren't particularly impacted 
by trauma. If if I'm being left in my cot to scream yeah. and cry because I've got a yeah. parent who's not responsive to my cries, if I'm mm. left hungry, in a wet nappy, neglected, if I'm being screamed at to stop crying rather than picked up and cuddled, you know, if, yeah. if that's going on around me, if my parent is being um, abused by a violent partner and she hasn't got the energy left or the capacity um, mm-hmm. because she's physically hurt herself to, to kind of be responsive consistently to my needs, mm. those early traumas have a big impact down the track. But what we've always thought, because as adults we think we should be able to talk about stuff, mm. But early trauma, trauma that happens before we're pre-verbal, uh, before we're verbal, is very difficult to get to. And a neglected baby will do two things. It will be extra difficult to mm. settle, mm. or it will become really passive. It'll get the baby will give up. Mm. You know. We all learn by experience. So if a baby learns that over time no one's going to respond to their cries, mm. they'll eventually stop crying mm. because it's not getting their needs met. It's a form of communication. And mm. so what we see is in the worst-case scenarios, we see babies who've just given up mm. trying to get an adult mm. to respond to their needs. And, and for such a long time because, A, they look easy to care for because Mm. they're very passive now Mm. um, and they're not verbal. They can't tell us what's going on. For those reasons, we used to think that babies weren't impacted by trauma. But what the science now is telling us is that that is absolutely not true Mm. and that the trauma will show itself in different ways now and down the track and Mm. we used to kind of have a system well we still do we have a system where we respond to behavior so lots of children with trauma show their trauma through their behavior and a lot of that behavior is challenging for adults they're Mm. unsettled they're disruptive at school they're you know disobedient Mm. you know a, a range of things they might have, you know, big explosive tantrums seemingly out of the blue. A lot of their behaviour is confusing and challenging for adults. Mm. It's not confusing and challenging for them. It makes sense. They're just biologically wired to try and survive this and they're using everything that they've got to do that. Um, Mm. So the system and, and adults are programmed to kind of respond to the challenging behaviour. When things are going from our yep. point, adult's point of view well, we yep. don't think there's anything that we need to deal with. But that passive baby mm. needs a lot of proactive attention. They need to be re-socialised into a world view, if you like, that adults are here to meet my needs mm. and that, If I cry, someone Mm. will respond. So that baby needs lots of holding, lots of cuddling, lots of physical stuff. It's almost like the way we try and talk about it is that kids with trauma have a range of unmet developmental needs. So if you think about what your child needs, what my child needed, kids needed you know it's that consistency that predictability that routine that they know what's gonna if I do this this will happen if I cry Mm. mum will come if I Mm. do this cry I'll get my nappy changed if I do this cry I'll get you know Mm. as parents we try test learn are you hungry do you need you know are you Mm. tired do you need your nappy changed do you need to be played with what is it that you need and we'd spend a lot of time trying to work that out and we kind of and Over time, kids come to learn that that parents are safe and parents are responsive. And so by the time they get to two, they use parents as that kind of safe base to then go off and explore the world and they know that if I fall, mum or dad or 
some significant adult, Nana will be there to pick me up and comfort me and I'll, you know, go off and explore again. I'll try standing up. I'll do all the things that kind of kids do because what gives them the capacity to do that is this safe, predictable, consistent, attuned relationship with the important adults in their lives. These kids haven't had that. So they've got lots of unmet developmental needs that get in the way of their development being able to progress. And so they they might be really resistant to trying new things because when they've tried new things, they've either fallen and no one's come to help them or they've been yelled at for doing whatever they've done Mm. or hit Mm. in the name of discipline for doing what they did. And so then you kind of have these kids where their development becomes really disrupted. And the work that we do is to try and unpack where the trauma started Mm. and in what ways their developmental trajectories have been impacted. Mm. And then we go back and meet those unmet developmental Mm. needs and work with the important people in that child's life to do that because children will live well, any child will live well, in a network of supportive, attuned, consistent adults. Mm. If we can, what we kind of try and do is resource those networks around the kids and if those networks don't exist, we try and build them around the Mm. children and resource those relationships to do the heavy lifting, to go back and meet those unmet developmental needs so that their development can be kick-started again and Mm. they can catch up with where they need to be emotionally, socially, physically, you know, in a whole range of ways. And to do that, what we try and help people to do is understand the meaning behind behaviour because Mm. so often parents look at behaviour or foster carers look at behaviour and they respond to the behaviour. And what we say is that behaviour is a form of communication. Kids don't, they're not adults, they don't have the cognitive capacity yet to to have abstract thought and, Mm. you know, complex thinking. They tell us what's going on. Like a baby's cry, we have to learn the baby's cry. For traumatised kids, their behaviour is the cry. So we Mm. need to see behaviour as a form of communication and learn what the behaviour is trying to tell us. And most often the behaviour is telling us about an unmet developmental need that they have. Yeah. If we only respond to the behaviour and try and stop children from behaving in a particular way, we're taking away the only toolkit they've got to survive. To express themselves, yeah. And so what we need to do is understand the meaning behind the behaviour, the need that sits under the behaviour, and meet that need. Mm. Once we meet the need, you'll find that the behaviour will actually reduce in intensity, reduce in frequency, because it's not needed anymore. It serves a purpose. It's trying to tell us something. And through meeting the need, we're actually able to then support kids to learn different ways of being in the world, different ways of communicating what they want because Mm. they learn that within the context of those relation trusted safe relationships that we're now building around them that they Mm. can lean into them Mm. and trust that their needs will be responded to in safe ways yeah in ways that are attuned to what they need yep that's interesting how long does it usually take sorry um how long does it usually take Look, and I guess this is very, you know, independent, dependent, age dependent, circumstances yeah. dependent. But if there was um, a sweet spot as to when would be uh, the best time to intervene or to reprogram or to reintroduce the normal normalcy of life, uh, is there any specific age range that you've observed? The, the principle of early intervention, the earlier you can get in, the mm. better, but there is no such thing as too late. Mm. What it means is the longer it's gone on is mm. will mean the longer it's going to take to yep. kind of 
unpack it all and and help kids develop um, new ways of being in the world in the context of, of safe relationships. This isn't about the focus being on the children. The, the children are the focus, but they're not the sole site of where the work yep. is. The work is getting those relationships around the children to understand. You know, what we would say, for example, is um, a child who finds it really hard to settle at night because bad things have happened to them in the past at night. You know, parents have been drunk, strangers have been in the house, fights have broken out. It's not uncommon for for children who've lived in situations where nights are not necessarily Mm. safe. Mm. Um, Those kids can find it very difficult to settle. Mm. And some of the work that we do with um, either parents who are now in safe situations or with foster carers or grandparents who are looking after the children they can find it really frustrating to get the kids to bed. You know, it's been a long day. Everyone's exhausted. The kids are, have got a range of strategies to, you know, just five more minutes playing the game or watching the TV, you know. Yeah. There's this whole kind of thing. And what we would say is the child needs you to stay close to them through this transition point at night because this is the time they're starting to feel least safe. This is the Mm. time of day when things weren't great. And even though now none of that is happening, they're with you and they are safe, they are triggered by the past in the present. What happened to them before is a very hard pattern to break. Yeah, yeah. They can't necessarily name it, but they're reacting to things that Mm. happened to them in the place where they weren't safe now, even though Mm. they are safe now. Mm. They're physically safe, but they haven't yet developed an internalised sense of felt safety. They can't fully trust it yet. Their bodies can't fully trust it yet. And so we'll say to a, a carer, you need to go to the child, develop a really consistent routine, and maybe it's about spending some time in the bedroom with the child. Does the child tolerate a light on or light off? Mm. You know, do you need a night light? Do you need to sit and do stories for even mm. 14 year olds? You know, mm. they love story time, a lot of mm. them. Mm. Or brushing of hair, or let's massage some cream into your hands, things that help them calm down, feel mm. connected to you, and have that sense of, of safety reinforced for them. Mm. That relational proximity how close you stay to kids through times when they can start to feel unsafe even though there's no tangible risk present Mm. are the things that kids need and so that's Mm. a lot of the work we'll do with nanas or foster carers or um, parents is to kind of help them understand kids sense of felt safety as opposed to the absence of physical risk and how do you through just simple daily routines, start to rewrite the rule book in their head Mm. around how the world works and what's going to happen so they can feel safe as well as be safe. Because once they start to feel safe, which is safety in the context of those relationships, they can settle. They're going to be less hypervigilant to where's the next risky thing going to happen. Yeah, And once they're able to feel safe and settle, then the world opens up to them because they're not in survival mode and they can start to learn and grow and experience joy and fun and all mm. the things that we want for them. Yeah, trusting. And that can take time. The longer, the deeper those tracks of trauma and the deeper those kind of behaviours that they've had to use to survive, the longer it takes to kind of help them trust that the mm. world is is different now 
It's not yeah. that place. And for them to trust and believe and feel safe within the relationships yeah. that are around them. Mm. So for some kids, it can take years. You know, if we get referred a nine-year-old whose trauma started when they were a baby, you've got nine years to undoing to do. Mm. If you get to that child as a one-year-old or two-year-old, then you've got two years of undoing to do. So mm. it, it really depends on um, when the trauma started and how long they've had to live with the impacts of it. So if you get a, if we had a, an eight-year-old referred and things had unraveled within their life and their family's life in the last 12 months, but up to that point, things had been, you know, okay, then that eight-year-old's not going to take as long to recover from what they've been through because they've got the first seven years of their lives to rely on. Mm. A child who's had good care for the vast majority of their life and then things have mm. gone bad um, mm. is going to be quicker to recover from the impacts mm. of that than a child who's lived with the chronic stress mm. and trauma in their bodies and their brains and, and you know, how they understand the world. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so the Australian Children's Foundation have been around for the past 28 years? No, we've, we're have just about next year will be next year. 2026 will be our 40th anniversary. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Amazing work. Amazing milestone. Yeah. Um, we've grown how- a lot. So we've grown Um, In the last 28 years, we've grown from an organisation that just used to work in the eastern metropolitan region of Melbourne, and we had about five staff when Jo and I started 28 years ago. We're now national and we've got over 300 staff. Ah, I see. I thought um, you and Jo actually started the foundation, but you joined when it was about 12 years in. It was about 12 years in, but it was Mm. a very small organisation back then. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And so how many children do you look after at any given year? And I know that it's changed now a lot, but uh, as a snapshot for, say, previous year or previous few years. We're directly supporting probably around 3,000 children a year nationally. Wow. And indirectly through our partnership work, probably another 10,000. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. We also do a lot of um, training. So part of what we try and do is build the capacity of other professionals to understand trauma and use that understanding in the way they work. So Mm -hmm. we kind of, you know, like to think that through that work as well, and that work reaches about 40,000 professionals a year. Yep. That, you know, if each of those working with 10 children every year, then that's 400,000 children a year, hopefully, through the training we're providing and and the opportunities for professional development that we're we're offering other people um, Mm -hmm. working in the field that, kids are receiving the benefit of that that they're working with. So we kind of try and reach as many people in the health, education, child and family welfare, legal, youth justice, homelessness, family Mm. violence sectors as we can because what we know is a trauma understanding is so critical Yep. and is still not there in lots of these sectors. So part of what we want to do is do the work ourselves, mm. add value to the work of others by working in partnership and build the general capacity of, of sectors to, to use the best available knowledge to understand the kids and the young people and the families we're working with so that their work can be as, as effective as possible. Yeah. Excellent. And the foundation is a non-profit organisation? We are a not-for-profit organisation, yep, yep. So we're reliant on uh, government funding for a lot of our services, but we also, that funds maybe 70% of our work. Um, And then we're 
reliant on our own fundraising to oh, do you do ones a year a couple of times a year um we have a we have a, a constant program of of um donations that we're trying to generate mm. we have corporate partnerships so target and one of mm. our corporate partners so we've got a range of corporate partnerships that are getting behind us we do community level fundraising there's a lot of um individuals that do fundraising for us as well through events and different things that they do runs and different things you know you can do that through the website and all the proceeds go to a charity so we have a lot of that um but our fundraising is really hard these days mm. it's a really competitive space the not-for-profit space there's a lot of charities out there trying to to raise mm. funds government funding is um getting harder and harder to be solely reliant on because the cost of running services is, is not being matched with the increases in the government funding that's given to us to, to do the work. Mm -hmm. The last thing we want to have to do is cut back services to match the funding level. Yeah. And so that's where our own fundraising comes in mm -hmm. and it's really important because that enables us to keep the, the the levels of service going um, mm. that we're able to to offer children and families. We already have waiting lists. The last thing we want to do is cut back. Yeah. Because the demand's already there. You know, we've got waiting lists of, of one and two years, which is really crazy and really sad that yeah. there is that much demand out there. And yeah. kids aren't getting a service for that long. Mm. You know, there's some kids that if they're referred to us when they're 14, 15, they'll age out before we can offer them a service. Yeah. They'll be too old then to be eligible yeah. to receive one according to our funding. So we're always looking to um, build up the effectiveness of our, our fundraising and our, our donations revenue so that we can top up the gap between the real cost of us delivering services and the government funding while we keep having conversations with government around you know stretching the budget yeah, stretching the budget and and kind of keeping pace with the increased costs of of delivering services um yep. with with the match level of funding yeah and we're not alone in that Every not-for-profit is in that situation at the moment with government funding. It's really challenging. It's really, really mm. challenging. Mm. But, we, you know, we, we do have some really good community people who are just consistently behind us and, and will give us um, donations. And for that, we're forever grateful because we can't do this on our own. We can't mm. do this work without the community behind us. Um for all the reasons I said, the only way we can try and keep up with the level of need in the community for the services we offer is to try and fundraise to 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 deliver that gap. Yeah. In funding. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. What I really like about your work, Janice, is not only do you practice, um, you're also an academic, so you're an adjunct mm -hmm. professor. Um and you're a mum, so you have, you know, the, this trifecta combination of just really cultivating all of your life's work and personal calling as well. How has your um, academic um, work impact your work here at the Israel and Children's Foundation, as well as your personal mother's motherhood journey as well? You know what I what I've seen the the, the problems we're trying to solve are, are kind of wicked problems. Yeah, you know we're trying to work out how do we prevent child abuse and the trauma that's caused by it. Yeah, I don't know that we can ever prevent it. Yeah, but we can certainly try and reduce the prevalence. You know, if you look at the Australian Child Maltreatment Study that was released mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, that's the the first robust data set for Australia that tries to paint a picture of the prevalence of child abuse in the community. And what that told us 
was that a quarter of the population have experienced more than one form of abuse. Mm. That one in four girls and one in five boys have been sexually abused. That upwards of 30, 40% of the community has been exposed to family violence as a child and impacted Mm. by family violence. This is a massive problem that we have. Mm. We need to get those numbers down. We need to find ways to reduce those numbers Mm. and we need the best possible service responses as early as possible to get in and provide the support that's needed to children and families where abuse has happened. And Mm. what I've learned along the way is that These are complex issues and too often government looks for easy solutions. Affordable, Mm. you know, they've got to be affordable from government's point of view and easy. And what government did for a while is said we need evidence-based. And Mm. when they talked about evidence-based, they talked about programs that were largely overseas programs that had used a methodology called randomised control trial. You know, it's the gold standard of evidence. But what that did was really highlighted the limitations of that approach of evidence and knowledge and research. And because Australia tried to import a lot of these programs and they didn't work. And they haven't worked in other countries where mm. they've tried to implement them. Mm. They work in a, in this in the country they were developed in for the population they were developed for under the criteria of the kind of trial conditions where you can mm. put a whole lot of caveats into. We'll only take these sorts of. Australia doesn't work like that. What I've learned is there is a lot to be gained through research and academic knowledge. There's Mm. a lot that we can learn from that. But equally important are lived experience knowledge. I've learned a lot through my own lived experience as a mum. It shaped how I kind of developed our parenting programs here at ACF. Mm. People who've survived abuse victims and survivors of abuse have incredible insights into what's helpful and what's needed. So lived experience is a knowledge base. It's a legitimate knowledge base that we need to pay as much attention to as we do research or academic knowledge. The other knowledge base that we need to draw from is cultural knowledge because Mm -hmm. unless we understand the cultural context within which we're trying to work and, and what that means and the particular practices of different cultures, if we're not sensitive to that and respectful of that, then we will also miss the mark. So there's cultural knowledges, there's lived experience knowledge, there's research and academic knowledge, and then for me there's practice wisdom. What are we all learning on the ground that we come to know about our work that is effective? And for me, it's the amalgamation of all of those sources of knowledge treated equally, not privileging one source of knowledge over another, but actually saying there are are different sets of knowledges that we need to bring together and translate and synthesise to make sense of what's going to happen. And that's Mm -hmm. a lot about what we do now through um, our professional education training programs, our Centre for Excellence in Therapeutic Care, is how do we bring all of these knowledges to bear, synthesise them in a way that's helpful and makes sense, and how do we translate and mobilise that knowledge so that it's usable? So if I'm a teacher or if I'm a social worker or if I'm a police officer or if I'm a youth justice worker, I'm a foster mum, I'm a kinship nana, how can I get access to the best available information and knowledge Mm -hmm. that's going to help me do my job, whatever my job is. And so 
I think what I've kind of landed on now is that academic research knowledge is important, but it's not the be all and end all because it's got a limited frame. It's got a whole lot of rules and disciplines about how it's generated that is mm -hmm. not inclusive enough of everything we need to know. Um, and I think this kind of pr privileging equally all these different forms of knowledge is the only way that we'll start to find some answers to these really complex and wicked problems. Mm. Relying on academic knowledge alone, which is kind of what we've done for a long time, has not served us well. And if yeah. you listen to our First Nations communities, yeah. That's the message they're telling us. You need to help design the solutions for us, with us. Yes, yeah. And, and you know, it's what we're hearing from adult survivors and, and young people. We're working with some amazing young people um, in their late teens and early 20s who have experienced sexual abuse and family violence and we're co-designing and letting them lead the development of initiatives and programs um, mm. that their knowledge and wisdom and lived experience tells them are going to be helpful mm. and bringing together groups of young people and kids to help advise us as to how we can continue to design and deliver our services. Yeah. That's so great to know. And I think having you at the helm um, with, you know, the great combination of the heart, the head and the hand um, all combined together, hopefully it'll create a much better um, resilient Australia going forward. Um, so you've spent the last 28 years with the foundation. What yeah. does the next 28 years look like for the foundation and for Australia at large? I would hope that, through the work that we do, we can create a more compassionate community for children. I think mm. that um, we've got to find compassion. I think that children, children to me and young people in particular, you know, teenagers are kind of like the canary in the coal mine. You know how they used to have the canary to see where the leaks were and where the problems are? I yeah. think that kids and young people are a bit of a canary in the coal mine to the challenges yeah. that we face in our society. The in problem an incredible is, way of looking at it. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, that that what we do is we start to either become overly protection protectionist you know the the current debates in this around social media and should children have access to social media before the age of, of 14 yep. but in the same breath as we're saying that mm. we're saying we should be locking children up in youth justice mm. facilities at the age of 10 so they can't mm. have access to social media till they're 14 but they mm. can be convicted of a crime at the age mm. of 10. Mm. That doesn't make, doesn't sense. make sense. It yeah. doesn't make sense. So I think we've got to kind of find compassion. We we regularly do public polling around this and we've done public polling for the last 20-something years and routinely child abuse ranks last be behind the state of roads and footpaths and a whole lot of things in as, as on the list of community concerns. And... When you kind of prompt people and say, oh, what about child abuse? It jumps to first. There's something about the community seeing child protection and the safety of children as a community concern that underpins a lot of the challenges that kids are facing these mm -hmm. days that we need to develop more compassion. So I would like to see the work of the foundation achieve a higher degree of compassion for kids mm. and the, the challenges and the struggles they had because we all know they're growing up into increasingly complex worlds. Mm. Um, and the second thing I would like us to do if we would kind of say we, we've been successful is for us to, as a as a community and as a country, to have a much clearer understanding and ways of enacting children's rights. Mm. You know, 
children are inherent rights bearers and too often parents see children's rights as in competition with their own and somehow it becomes the scale you know the more rights Mm -hmm. kids have the less rights parents have Mm -hmm. children have rights parents have responsibilities and obligations adults have responsibilities and obligations to children children have inherent rights as children that need to be respected and we need to find ways to respect those more you know children have a right that we're growing up in a world you and I and and lots of adults kind of talk about the online world and the real world Mm. kids are growing up in a world where that just is their world Mm. and the idea that kids can't have access to the digital world Mm. um, until they're 14 is not realistic Mm. we live in a world where digital is all part of our breathing you know there's something about we've got to support parents and I think you know if if we could do this in the next few years the task of parenting is changing Mm. and you know we need to help parents see from day dot children have a range of developmental needs and one is digital literacy and resilience Mm. from infancy And if we build that kind of thinking into what do adults need to do differently, how does parenting change and evolve in this increasingly Mm. new world that we're all growing up into, then kids Mm. will be better equipped. Mm. And we won't need to have the argument around what age can kids have access to things because we'll have grown them up in ways that as much as we help them understand risks in the physical world and and try and protect them from that, we'll be doing the same sort of work in the digital space. Mm. Interesting. Watch this space. Watch this space. <laughs> yeah, my eight-year-old is, uh, I'm right, right in that uh, sweet spot where my eight-year-old is just asking, can I do, can, I don't know, whatever games is on um, this today and I always put a time limit on that but you're right it's it it needs to go beyond that it's we need to be digital literate and uh, find ways on how we can build our own resilience and then we can pass on the learning because it's not no longer about a yes or no or about how long but it's about the whole all encompassing how and what to do if something else happens yeah I think it's for me it's about helping parents see that as much as you wouldn't let your child go and play in a house down the street if you didn't know where they were going and who was in that house, Mm. it's the same thing that's happening online. Mm. So how do we start to help parents think about what do I do to safeguard my children in the physical world, Mm. in the digital world? And I think too often we see time online as time when we don't have to interact with our kids. That's the, the kind of, you know, it's the TV. It's the, the, yeah. it's the, it's the to, nanny. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can get some stuff done. You know, yeah. go and play on your computer, go and play on your iPad, go and mm. do whatever mm. in the online world. And I think what we need to do is think them playing online is the same as playing out in the backyard. Mm. We would go out and kick a ball or be interested in what they're doing. And we need to kind of think, I need to do that in the digital space as well. well. Mm. I need to join them in their online games. I need to take an interest in what they're doing. I need to understand Mm. the things that are motivating them and and piquing their interest online and be in there with them so that, you know, we can go, oh, that doesn't sound right or I need to have a chat with you about that or I need to go and find out more about that so that I can feel confident that that's where you should be, you know, but mm. we kind of haven't quite got there yet. They're child-minders. Yeah. <laughs> go and do that yeah, while right. I make dinner or go and yeah. do that while I finish work, yeah. know, working from home, you know. So yeah. I think it's that it's that mindset we need to help parents shift to build mm. their confidence and their competence to understand mm. the digital world and then see themselves as needing to play in that space with their children mm. in the same way that they do 
in the physical world, in real life. Mm. Perfect. Thanks for that. <laughs> Good tip for me. <laughs> and for other breadwinning mums listening. Um, so you've just stepped into the uh, formal CEO role this mm -hmm. year. You're also a mum with adult kids, but they're still your kids nonetheless. Yeah, well, I How also are got you one at home. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> How are you making it all work? Are there any specific traditions or any specific rituals that you do in order to keep a sense of normalcy or a sense of balance in your life? As much as I can, I try and put boundaries around how much time I spend doing work mm. and spending time with the kids. I think, you know, one of the things that we kind of think as our kids get older is that they need us less, yep. which is true in some ways, but what's more true is that they need us differently. Yeah. And I think it's about, um, for me, it's about making sure that, the important people in my life are getting what they need from me met and I'm getting to spend time having some fun with them, mm. not just mm. troubleshooting their problems but actually spending some time. I just got back from overseas and I took my son with me, my next trip. I'll take my daughter with me just oh, so nice. I can spend some one-on-one -on -one time. So I think it's a juggle and sometimes, you know, I do drop a few balls but I think it's the discipline. It's You've just got to go, you know what, this could gobble up 100 and however many hours in a week. You know, it could take 28 hours of my day if I let it mm. and I would have nothing left. You've, so I've just got to say, you know, that can wait. I think it's harder these days because everything is instant, you know, emails and if I think about the world before email and internet and stuff it was fax machines and phone calls there wasn't an expectation that you are reachable yeah instantly all the time so developing some good practices around I actually don't need to respond to that now that can wait mm. it's mm. more important for me to go and go for a walk take the dog for a walk watch some TV, spend some time with one or either of the kids or go and visit some friends, go and have a coffee, do something like that. I think mm. you burn out otherwise. Yeah. And okay. that's good for no one. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. If you could give your younger self, I guess that young Janice who went with your mum to spend the relief weekend uh, with other kids, what's a state? If you could give that younger Janice one advice, knowing all of the wealth of knowledge that you've gained now as a CEO, as um, a, a professor, but also as a mum, what one advice would you give that younger Janice? I think the advice would be don't underestimate the difference you can make if you don't if you don't accept the limits that other people will impose on you. Like challenge the boundaries. Don't accept that you can only operate inside the boxes that other people define for you. You have the confidence in yourself that you have some wisdom around what will be helpful that might challenge how everyone else thinks about it but have the confidence to kind of take that stand and try and shake the tree. That's awesome. Leads me back to that younger Janice who's reading that paragraph at school. Mm. You know, don't be defined by whatever the storyline is telling you, but having the courage to go over and beyond that and, and asking, is this the right way to go about it? Are there different ways to go about it? Can we do yeah. it better? Yeah. I think the other thing, because the, I was the first in my family, my family were um, British migrants. I was the first generation in my family to go to university. Mm. My mum was very much a stay-at-home mum and I know that I had to kind of navigate the fact that I had a career and two small children at the same time mm. and often ran kind of into sticky conversations with my mum about it. Yep. I think the other thing that I would say to the young me is you can't 
always, you know, the have it all. It's mm. going to take a lot and be kind to yourself and you yeah. don't have to be perfect all the time. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Janice. And one last question that I always ask all mums is, what's your alpha mum song? So if you have a very, very heavy week at work, your kids are demanding much of your time and you don't feel well yourself, what one song do you play on the back of your mental mind to make it through the week? That's a great question. Do you know the song that popped into my head, and I don't know why, is simply the best? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I think it's just a song because what I will do is I will put whatever the song is loud and it's a bit yeah. anthemy. Yeah. yeah. So it will be a song that I can just sing really loud at the top of my voice and yeah. it will kind of just release a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and keep you going for sure. And keep you going, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Janice. I really appreciate you spending some time with us, but also sharing all of your life's learnings. Um, for those of us listening who really want to support the cause of the Australian Children's Foundation, what would be the best way to support you? Um, so you could go to the website, www.childhood.org.au, and you'll find um, find out more about us and ways that you can donate. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you so much for doing all of the great work again. Keep Thanks, going. And Thanks I'll for the opportunity for the I'll chat. It's been really lovely. Of course. Thank you, Janice. See you okay. then. Bye. Bye. This episode of The Breadwinning Mums was produced by me, Jane Lim, and our theme music was produced by Sam McNally. We recorded this episode on the lens of dark people who have passed their parenting story for generations. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and thank them for caring for country. Connect with us through LinkedIn or Instagram at Breadwinning Mums. Until next time. Thank you.